Hello, my name is Janas Kokan. I'm the co-founder of Frogix. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining our Frogix YouTube channel today. If you like the content that we're sharing and the ideas that we're discussing, please like it, comment on it, and share it. And most importantly, come and join us on our live events. You have the opportunity to discuss with experts, exchange with like-minded people, and expand your perspectives all around topics related to sustainable building, sustainable living, and uh, I also want to encourage you to click the little notification bell, subscribe to our channel, and never ever miss another episode of Frog Week Screen Tech Talks in the future. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Have a great day. Great pleasure to welcome everybody uh, on this call today. Our topic is green cooling system for uh, green cooling systems for buildings. So we had this idea to come with this uh, topic quite some time ago over summer. You know, we had a hot summer in Europe and all across the world. It was a little bit uh, of a challenge to witness what is happening with the temperature. And, uh, you know, uh, for the building industry, it's it's a very interesting element to manage um, and to, um, yeah, especially do it better in, in uh, going to the future. So we have different solutions that we would like to share with you. Uh, first, uh, we will be having uh, Ms. Netu Jain from Indian uh, Green Building Council talking about coatings for buildings for uh, different types of materials that have a reflective uh, function and can reduce the temperature in a building. So also quite an interesting element besides other properties or uh, yeah, uh, applications that you can utilize such coatings too. We will have as a speaker also Mr. Jean-Baptiste Chaldro from Restore Forest today uh, here with us. He's going to be introducing uh, the more uh, nature-based uh, solutions or approach uh, to, you know, having uh, energy efficiencies using less air conditioning in summer with using small forests or mini forests in your uh, close area of a building. So thanks a lot uh, to both of you for joining. And uh, I see we have on the call. Um, yeah, we have uh, two um, speakers of today on the road, so it's going to be either we will have quite a more relaxed discussion or we will have a very packed one. So depending on this, uh, eventually we will come also uh, to Ms. Sunil Stevens, who is uh, the co-founder of the Hemplock uh, company uh, based in UK. So they are working with natural insulation materials. As the name already says, it's going to be about hemp. So they have quite some interesting elements uh, around, you know, utilization of new materials. And last but not least, um, typically what you saw on the cover is the green solutions, the, the walls, the roofs that have also an impact. Now we wanted to pick also maybe the, the next generation, same as what Richard was presenting, the next generation of solutions that is going to be maybe more common. And this is the combination of green walls with algae, using algae as the material, basically, as the... As the also, um, yeah, interesting uh, elements. So just to educate and share what is possible. So with this, I would just hand over to Netu, uh, if that is okay for you. Yeah, thank you, Jana. And I would like to use my presentation so that uh, your audience can actually see what type of solutions I'm providing. So I heartily welcome everyone. And uh, as I said, I'm from Panash. And the vision of Panache is how we can create cool green cities. And for that, our flagship product is the cool tops, that is high SRI coatings. We also call them as high SRI coatings. So if we see, like, see, uh, the initiation what I took is from India. And I have considered for, uh, for this time exactly, I have considered Indian temperature and Indian climatic conditions. So the complete presentation will be accordingly because my experience and the developments are accordingly. So presently we see the challenge, the global temperature rise is the major challenge and to have thermal comfort without AC. So after COVID, everyone is very conscious to use AC. So we need to have thermal comfort without AC or with less AC also. And urban heat island impacts, that is exactly leading to the climate change. That is a very big challenge for all of us. As the urbanization is going on, we are seeing that in every country, urbanization is there. We have to develop the structures to meet, mitigate the urbanization and the development. So buildings have to be created. But the irony is that every building material gets heated up more than the atmospheric temperature. For example, in India, if the atmospheric temperature is 40 degrees centigrade, the temperature of the concrete and the stone 
uh, surface gets heated up to 60 to 70 degree high and as you see the all logistic warehouses structures are there industrial metal structures are there the surface of that metal structures gets heated up up to 70 to 80 degree centigrade in peak summer times so how exactly we can uh, the, this exactly the heat uh, gets emitted into the atmosphere also and the ingress of heat is also there and the premises seems to be like an oven and it's very difficult for people to live into that uh, and also to work under the sheds with that heated temperature and this temperature of 70 degree heat is emitted in the atmosphere that leads to adding the atmospheric temperature at the higher side. So what's the way out normally when we think about the solutions? So we look about thermal insulation, we look about solar generation, how we have to get energy efficiency, it's like solar generation can be done. Other what we see is energy efficient equipments we would like to use and plantation. So what like we are not looking of like how we can reduce the temperature, the 70 degrees uh, temperature. We are looking once the temperature is increased, how to reduce that ingress and how to reduce uh, the ingress of that temperature. So my objective is to work on the root cause so that our building envelope or any of the build structure temperature doesn't get that heated up, the, the, doesn't get that rise in temperature. So what if we stop the heating of the roof and walls and roads or any of the build structure so that less heat is generated and less heat is transmitted indoors and less heat is emitted in the atmosphere also. So we in Panash exactly thinks that energy efficiency can be uh, like a cool insulated surface can be very effective to get the energy efficiency and we wish to contribute to world to fight the global challenge of rising temperature. For this we have three range of products. For the roof we have cool tops. These are roof coatings. For wall we have cool wraps. These are wall paints, cool wall paints. And for the cycle track and pavements we have another paints. So to understand the working of these paints Exactly, this is the solar power distribution, the radiation that is coming from sun. And you can see that the maximum part is of IR radiation. And these IR radiation are responsible to generate heat. So these radiation exactly are being absorbed, converts into heat energy and this surface get heated up. And that is why everything that gets into the sun gets heated up. So what our coating does is, it reflects these IR radiation. If the IR radiation are coming, and if no treatment is being done, it converts into heat and the heat ingress is there. The surface temperature gets heated up. So what these coating do is it re reflects the heat. It reflects the IR radiation so that heat is not generated. And we can have reduced surface temperature by 20 degrees centigrade. And indoor temperature can be reduced by 4 to 8 degrees centigrade when the atmospheric temperature is 40 degree. So... In India, exactly, we have a lot of case studies wherein our product cool top reduces the indoor temperature by 4 to 8 degrees centigrade and the surface temperature is reduced by 15 to 25 degree. It ranges between 15 to 25 degrees centigrade in different structures in different time of the day and in different peak summers, the temperature difference is uh, seen. And this is the way we can have thermal comfort without AC also. And in the warehouses and logistic area, we have lack of square meter of surface of metal, which gets heated up to 70 degrees centigrade. So in that area, exactly, if we apply these cool top coatings, it can be drastically thermal comfort can be achieved. The people can have a healthy living, uh, healthy working condition, and they can feel very product. They can be very productive. So we are your partners to get net zero also and cool buildings without AC. These coating reduce the AC requirement, reduce the electricity cost, reduce insulation requirements, increase the occupied thermal comfort and labor productivity. Another very good point is if we apply these coating and then we apply solar panel, the solar panel efficiency is also increased. We can help to reduce the city temperature, reduce the UHI impacts, reduce the CO2 emissions, Research study says that if we apply 1000 square feet of this coating, we can reduce the carbon emissions 
10 tons of carbon emissions can be offset in one year, annual year. And thus, it also improves the air quality. So, if we talk about the individual occupant of the building, optimum thermal comfort, electricity saving, sustainable goals, solar efficiency, equipment life can be extended, better indoor quality, production and process loss is reduced, and a lot of health benefits are there. This is one of the case study of one of the industry. There we got 8 degree of temperature difference. It is a food beverage industry and <clears throat> it actually uh, have a lot of uh, <clears throat> issues in the production because of the heat. Again, this is one of the case study wherein like this is the first green building in India. It is the IGBC headquarter in Hindabad. It was the third building in the world and first building in India to be going green. And this has now gone net zero. And after applying our high SRI coating, these cool roof coatings, the efficiency has increased by 15%. We have also tried these uh, coatings on these type of tankers. And we have seen that they have a lot of benefit wherein like uh, diesel is uh, diesel consumption is reduced, product quality is improved, product yield is improved, and uh, an insulation effect that was there, they were using PU foams and the insulation impact is also increased. And similarly, this is one of the competitor. This is a paint company. You must be knowing very big company. So there in their premises also, we have applied our coatings. So these are certain areas. It can be applied on cement roof. It seems like this. This again is a cement roof, but it is a Warringal smart city where we did this project. This type of proflex roof also it can be applied and these coating increase the efficiency of these type of eco ventilators, HVLS fans, the big fans and the evaporative cooling, district cooling, this increase uh, efficiency very much. These are the variants for the roof coating. And in our variants, we have a good primer. Uh, this complete system is there. Similarly, we have wall coatings. And we are uh, founding members for CRRC, that is uh, School Roof Rating Council. For the wall rating program, we are exactly their founding partners. And similarly, we have the coatings for the reflective payments and driveways to combat the UHI impacts. And these are available in these four colors. And this is the NASA document that says that if we apply on the road and payments, the surrounding temperature can be reduced. And uh, these are the some associations with which we are associated. Uh, Green Pro, Griha, IGBC, Warehousing Association, CRRC. And we have certain awards like we were given Power of Idea Awards. We have participated in many of the research projects. And this is some of the credentials. And this is me. And this is my journey. And I just wish people uh, join me to mitigate the UHI impacts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Netu, for this amazing presentation. I mean, you know, the <clears throat> once you see the data, you are kind of flashed, flashed by the numbers. It's it's great to see that you know, with the Indian uh, Green uh, Building Council, you know, you try out things, you, and you you are the first one. So that that is great and really uh, wonderful um, insights. And looking forward to the discussion. And I have some questions regarding the buildings for sure, and you know, the application. So JB, would you like to take it up from here? and tell us more about Miyawaki and how we can, you know, also change the temperature, manage the temperature of buildings using your method. So as I said in introduction, I'm an engineer in energy efficiency. So I really like energy uh, study, but also in parallel, as I built um, and planted mini forest with my family, we see the, the connection between uh, energy and also nature. So we are convinced that uh, nature can work in close collaboration with energy to make uh, efficient synergy. And if we if we take a look back at the overview of the evolution of buildings and the inclusion in their environment, clearly we, we can see that uh, we did not take the right choices so far. So if we take uh, the evolution from the, from the left side. So these were really ancient uh, temples that were actually built inside nature, inside forests. So in this case, it's in Japan, 
It's a Shinji no Mori. Uh, that is to say that it's a temple built in nature, and the human is not allowed to temper or handle this nature anymore. So they stayed like this. And a few, few uh, centuries later, at the Middle Age, we started to, to build stone buildings. Uh, at, at this period, we were still on renewable energy with, uh, uh, with wind, uh, water, and biomass. And the buildings in this uh, period were already using low-tech tricks. Uh, here you see a cloister uh, close to a cathedral. And in these spaces, in these buildings, there were some nice design tricks to get the cool air streams inside the buildings. But then um, a great thing ap appeared and or it's our current disaster, but we discovered the fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels were really a cheap, convenient energy. But uh, with that, we, we have acted like small kids. We didn't took time to, or effort to, to design buildings with a system approach and holistic approach. And in the 70s, uh, the air conditioning units really were in a boom so modern architects now they put usually ac units on the top of the building or on the side of the building but on the top of the design and we end up with the right picture when we see that from now on we live in really artificial cities with gray concrete black asphalt and mineral pavement and these cities are really suffocating when we when we encounter uh, drought and heat waves, as we did with uh, the last summer, for example. It can be really a living hell to live in such cities. And on the right uh, bottom picture, this is clearly for me the nightmare to to live in. <laughs> this is the new town district of uh, Dubai. It, it has been released uh, this year. It's called Nad al Sharba. And this town district is really built in the middle of the desert. And you see that uh, it's a town district with individual houses, with air conditioning units, totally disconnected with nature. And how, when we look at this evolution of buildings, we, uh, I see three main things. Um, the first is that. Thanks to cheap fossil fuels, architects have added ACE air conditioning units everywhere. Uh, now the cities we live in are full of artificial surfaces that is not good for to store heat and to create heat island phenomena. And then we have a clear disconnection uh, from nature. So what could be a solution? We can feel that, and in ancient times, it was already the case that the trees can provide a clear benefit on cooling, on natural cooling. These photos uh, are from my production. I made them. On the left photo, uh, it was last summer on vacation in the south of the Netherlands. And even in the Netherlands, we, we experienced drought and, uh, and heat waves. This was quite unusual. But even in, in the north of Europe, it's possible now. And you see, uh, there is a first clue. On the, on the right uh, side of the road, you see this burnt lawn by the sun that is orange or yellow. And on, on the other side, on the left side of the road, you see shrubs and little trees that remain green. So this is the very first clue. Then on the right, on the top photo, you see tourists that who were making a bike tour and they take their break uh, under the shade of trees and not on the benches on the parking lot a few meters away. And at this specific spot, there was a difference of temperature of 10 degrees C between the parking lot and the shade of the trees. And the last one on the right, the bottom picture, 
is the view uh, from my apartment, from the balcony of my apartment in Amsterdam. And this is a very typical uh, architecture from Amsterdam, where you have rectangular blocks with buildings of uh, three levels, and you have an inner courtyard. And in this courtyard, you have a lot of green. And you can feel the temperature difference between this inner courtyard with trees and shrubs and the other side of the street where you have mineral pavement. And this leads to, to the benefits from trees. Trees really are natural air conditioner because they provide water retention. You can feel that close to trees, you can feel this moist uh, climate and this moist air. They provide shade, so you don't have direct sunlight with burning rays from the sun. And finally, you have, that's the main point, evapotranspiration, that's the actual transpiration from trees that provide cooling effects. And according to the French Energy Agency, one major tree is equivalent to five air conditioning units. So clearly, this is a powerful tool to have cooling in our environment. And trees provide clearly a, a microclimate around them. So on the effect and resource, um, we, we see that for summer, the effect of trees and the benefits are clear. On the left picture, you can see uh, a study of temperature measurement, of surface temperature uh, measurement that has been done in Poland uh, last summer in 2021. And you see that the top temperature is reached on the dark metal surface of the car, and the lowest temperature is, is reached below the tree uh, in this microclimate in the grass. Uh, so clearly, we, we see a huge difference between the surrounding of the trees and artificial uh, cities. But also in winter, in winter, Trees can provide clear benefits on energy costs. Uh, trees are living organisms, so they restore heat to the surroundings. And also, they can be a wind barrier against cold wind. So also in winter, uh, around buildings, trees can be beneficial. And according to the United Nations uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, strategic placement of trees in urban areas can cool down the air up to minus 8 degrees C and also reduce air conditioning needs by 30% and save 35% in energy used for eating. So clearly, this is a great benefit to have trees and tree community in the direct neighborhood. So this is my last slide. And this is a mission of restoreforest.com to add patches of nature in cities with the Miyawaki mini forest. So Dr. Akira Miyawaki is a Japanese botanist, spent his whole life to study first nature, to develop new forests based on the learnings from nature. And you can see on the picture in the middle that um, mini forests are popping up all around the world, around factories, but also around universities, uh, buildings, for example, where the effect is really good. And also in urban environments, it can be a sound barrier and noise barrier, but clearly a green oasis for the future heat waves. So that's it from my side. Thank you so much, um, uh, JB, for the amazing presentation. I mean, you know, you, you put the data also very clear. So it's, it's uh, you know, many of us saw, saw this element or you experienced it yourself. So it's, it's you know, I believe. Yeah, you, you need to get to the realization point that you say, hey, yes, th there is a difference in the shade. So with this, I would just open the floor for questions. If anybody would like to start from the audience, um, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question. Is there any kind of limitation to apply your coatings? Um, and what is the durability of these coatings? You mentioned there is also an extension of material durability possible. So what, what I mean, what are the kind of 
things that you can share with us on this? Yeah, in limitation, exactly. Uh, you cannot apply this on the transparent surface because it will give an opaque effect. So mm -hmm. that is the limitation. And uh, otherwise, we have applied on every type of substrate and every type of material. So that is not a limitation. And uh, life, like we have a complete system. When we apply with the complete system, that proper primer is there, uh, mm -hmm. ceramic based primer is there. And they like we have a, a elastomeric coating and then a transparent uh, coating that acts as a, a protective laminate coating. If we apply the complete system, the life is almost more than eight years. And we have repeated clients uh, like who has applied for 10 years also, eight years also. And after eight years also, a simple maintenance coat is applied. Otherwise, they, no other thing is. But it is not like you have to completely scrub it off and then apply. Beautiful. And <clears throat> can you also maybe share with us? Yeah. Or anybody would have a question. Sorry. JP, yeah. go first, of course. Yeah. I have two questions for Nitu. Um, I know that there was a, a French startup uh, developing similar coatings uh, based on oyster uh, particles in the paint. Uh, uh, in your paint, what, what is the chemical structure or what, what, it, what does provide the effect of uh, uh, sun uh, reverberation? Yeah, see, these have uh, many reflective agents in it and uh, those help uh, to reflect the particularly IR spectrum only. And another uh, is like every uh, raw material that is being added. It has to be like we have to see the reflectivity and the emissivity part of that uh, raw material. And the mesh size also plays a role in it. So mesh size of all the material and the fillers are being considered uh, very quickly to have the reflection. So different people are using different formulations and different uh, base material. So we have a different mix of uh, reflective agents in it. Okay, and my, my second question is uh, applying uh, this great coating on roof. Have you ever experienced, uh, I don't know, mental barriers from people thinking that it will reverb, reverb uh, towards planes or <laughs> I don't know. So that is you're asking about the glare part that uh... Yeah, do, do you have people that um, have um, fears about the light uh, reflection about the, the protein? No, exactly. Uh, it's majorly a myth that uh, like uh, uh, that uh, glare is there. Exactly. After one day, exactly, or after two, three hours, uh, the glare exactly subsides. And, uh, you know, like if nothing is applied, only tile is applied on the roof, then also if you come from a dark, dark room and then go out in the sunlight, you will find a difference uh, like in the because your eyes take some time to adopt to the uh, like illumination. So only that difference is there. Otherwise, no glare is there. And in fact, uh, in the night also, uh, if you see by the uh, Google images, uh, it actually uh, like the CRRC and the, all the research paper says that it actually prevents accidents because in the night also, it is not that dark. You can understand that this is some place where the coating is done, like when it is done on the roads and pavements. So it uh, reduces the uh, accidents also. So mm -hmm. that way you cannot say that it is a glare, but yes, your eyes uh, take some time to adjust from when they are coming from the dark in the light. So that is the difference. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, great question, JB. And also I was wondering in terms of the uh, scale or scale or the, the variations in terms of color, is it white based and then you have some white based uh, oh. colors or how is that? Yeah, for the roof exactly, we recommend to go for the, with the white color. Uh, you can actually have pastel color shades and for the uh, walls exactly we are using pastel color shades and the, for the payments also we are using pay, pay, uh, pastel color shades because on the payments and the walls the high SRI the one measure value is the reflectivity and the emissivity SRI value is not required that high so pastel colors can be used for the roof the maximum ingress of the heat is from the roof for the roof we recommend to go for the white mm. color. Okay, Th thank you so much, uh, Netu, for uh, answering uh, those questions. Uh, if there would be no question right now to Netu, I would. Hi. Uh, yeah. Good oh. afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? We yeah. can hear you, Dr. Chabra. 
Thank you for joining yes. us. Please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, I would like to ask, what is the efficiency of the reflectance, basically, of the paint? Uh, efficiency means? Uh, means um, if I have, let's say, 100 particles of light coming, what is the yeah. number which so is actually... If we see back? about the reflectivity, part, it goes up to 89%. So uh, different products have different reflectivity. And uh, like if we talk about my products, it's 89% of reflectivity is there and emissivity is also 90%. And uh, like with with time, exactly the percentage of reflectivity is reduced. And uh, that is why age SRI is being considered means after four years also, what type of reflectivity it will be giving. So that has to be there. And uh, if we talk about uh, one SRI value is there, that is the measure. So our aged SRI value is almost 75. What is being recommended for people to uh, use the SRI at, from the very start day? Okay, uh, actually I I was reading, going through a study uh, and they, they mentioned that they had an efficiency of approximately 96%. They were using some uh, additive called uh, sodium no, no exactly. Uh, recently, exactly, we had a discussion. And uh, if we talk about uh, days one, uh, like ultra white uh, paint has come. Yes, that, exactly. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. So that. it is uh, ultra white paint. And recently, exactly, it has been observed that that ultra white paint, uh, like for the initial time, it will be 96%. It doesn't uh, remain that 96%. And it is actually not very good. Uh, for the eyes that 96 percent reflectivity and the reflectivity has to be only in the uh, ir spectrum that is also very important and the reflectivity uh, like for the uh, colors everything the reflectivity will be in the uh, that uh, visible spectrum but just a minute for the uh, reflect uh, reflectivity part it should be in the ir spectrum if and in that uh, there is one part uv spectrum so your product should not be showing reflectivity in the UV spectrum. If the, it shows a reflectivity in the UV spectrum, it can actually um, helps to it. It can actually lead to cataract development also. So very high reflectivity is also not uh, recommended. Uh, any studies where I can find more details about uh, uh, these? Uh medical conditioning uh, conditions happening because of paint uh, see uh, recently there was a discussion, recently there was a discussion in sep so i exactly raised the question from the uh, crrc uh, the cool roof rating council and they had uh, given me few uh, like uh, like um, notes to study i can share that i have shared my uh, mail ID and uh, you can connect me and I can share the details that are required by you. Thank you. Beautiful. And also, Dr. Chabra, if you would like to, uh, same as for everybody, if you like to drop in the chat, your contact details would be great so people can connect with you also on LinkedIn. We're all on LinkedIn, I believe. So it's, you know, growing the network. And uh, Richard, you had a question. Would you like to place it now? And then we would go to JP. I have some questions to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I do have some uh, question and, and a comment a bit as well. It's, uh, you know, we we have, uh, you know, throughout the tropics, um, roofs that are built with, well, they're called tin roofs often, right? And what they are really is steel. And oftentimes they're, they're uh, coated with, with a uh, zinc, you know, uh, a galvanized coating so that they do last, you know, last longer. And uh, so all of these metals, you know, they have a quite high reflectivity. So, uh, you know, a zinc coated uh, steel is, is up in that range of 80%. And you would think that that would mean that it would be cool. But the problem often is, you know, and, and this is where, you know, we do need this research. So I appreciate so much that, you know, in India, you're really studying, looking at these issues carefully. Um, so the the um, the physical uh, you know um, issue, which is dominating, is emittance, and emittance of of the coating um, in the right spectrum, which is in in the uh, low temperature spectrum, is what leads to a cooler roof surface, and you know so 
if you just paint and put a good paint on any like these you know tin roof you you'll get a completely different uh outcome of of the temperature maximum temperatures um and but any any uh coating that's opaque you know whether it looks white or black is actually absorbing right that that is that is an issue um so and then you've got this uh re-emitting you you've got absorption and then emittance it's the emission of the energy from that uh, surface. So um, one of the best ways to keep a surface really cool is that it has a zero uh, absorption, absorption or reflection, because reflection also can involve uh, molecular interactions with the light. You know, it, it's received and then it's, it bounces off. But there, there, there's energy, you know, interactions. Um, a total transmission, and in a total spectrum, um, means that there's almost no interaction of the material with with the photons, with the energy, right? So, so if if we have materials that are very transparent, for example, polyethylene, just natural polyethylene. Now, I'm not looking at, of course, the durability because there's interactions with these plastics with UV in particular de degrades them. But, but just looking at the total spectrum compared to glass, for example. So in, in my world, you know, I, I look at transparency mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And there are two basic types of greenhouses. You can cover with polyethylene film or you can cover with glass. Of course, the, you know, Dutch, the Dutch glass system like Venlo all over the world. And then you have the American, you know, uh, conceived uh, type of, uh, plastic house. So um, interesting that, that the polyethylene is, is uh, very transparent, even in, in the long wave radiation, which is at the body temperature, you know, that, that we sense, you know, thermal heat. So when we look at the solar spectrum, we have to understand that the IR, the, 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 that long wave radiation is still far from our body temperature, right? So that's the near IR. The far IR is in our body temperature, and some materials, including polyethylene as a cover, are very transparent in, in that whole spectrum. So whereas glass, for example, is not. And so glass can create more heat retention than a polyethylene overnight. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's all these radiative aspects. And what I see, and I've you know, been in this field for all my life, and I see that the institutions and the research institutions are not looking at these issues. And that when mm -hmm. we, when, and one of the reasons I believe is that um, transparency or the whole issues of the radiant effects on buildings is, is ignored by the, by the building sector because we just look at windows as one aspect or element of a building and all the other elements are opaque, right? So, <laughs> It's, it's like windows are not really analyzed in, in how they really um, impact uh, buildings that great. And yet they are now the biggest issue in, in building air conditioning, right? And, and overheating of buildings because we've done the vapor barriers, we've done the insulation, you know, and the remaining, the remaining big factor is, um, is lighting, lighting in buildings mm -hmm. and daylighting. And daylighting is the cheapest. You know, that's free. That's free energy. So, you know, in, and in the developing world, we want that free energy, but it comes with a, with, 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 with a disadvantage that the same glazing lets daylight in visible spectrum lets in all the other spectrum as well. So what, what, well, maybe I'll just leave that as, as a comment, you know, maybe, uh, you know, after we can maybe come back and I'll, I'll explain mm -hmm. a little bit more about our you know, particular approach. For sure, for sure, Richard. And thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts on this and so many insights and so many perspectives that you connected this and all are so valuable and so uh, important to mention. And they are, as, as you said, and that's the status where we are. So uh, really great. Um, where I would uh, just maybe uh, go back to right now and definitely you should join us also on the sessions going forward because we focus on the building segment. You have apparently a lot of experience, a lot of perspectives that you that you uh, can share and also that add value to the discussion and to bringing, you know, discussion forward. 
I would then uh, go right now to JB, uh, because also looking a little bit in the time, being conscious about this. Uh, JB, when talking about the Miyawaki forest, um, is there any kind of limitation from your side? Because I like also the combination uh, going into, you know, uh, thinking how climate change will change the way we think and live and, you know, all the conditions around that. I truly believe in a fusion of uh, progressive technology and very much nature-based technology that needs to come together to get best results suitable for the ecotype, suitable for the conditions. So when going back to this and thinking about the trees and, you know, all the amazing stuff, the information that you shared, um, what is the limitation for an urban space? We have uh, so many times a problem with degraded soil. You know, you have little space. We go to a center somewhere in Europe and it's all paved everywhere. It's, you know, cement or, you know, pavements all, all around the place. So uh, what are the limitations for you? How you would see they can be um, overcome if you have any solution or if you kind of, you know, envisioning this? And <clears throat> yeah, maybe you can give us some key key data. I mean, how do you, how would you work in a city which is paved with uh, Miyawaki forests method? Yeah, indeed. Uh, one more time, the, the challenge is really the the mind barrier and mind limitation of the human, because uh, as we see uh, all along our history, we disconnected slowly from nature to live in artificial uh, lands and cities. So right now I see uh, more, we, we have built this artificial environment and now the real challenge is to go back to nature uh, because in, in some culture, uh, nature can be seen as dangerous. So to bring back nature in our environment is really the challenge. Um, when I speak with people, for example, um, um, when I say that uh, the mini forest in cities will bring back uh, biodiversity, they are fear they are fierce about uh, wild animals coming back, for example. Uh, but uh, usually, it's more butterflies that are coming back and birds than uh, than I don't know rats or or wild animals. And also in the integration with um, with buildings. Uh, the other uh, challenge is that um, property owners and uh, um, building managers, uh, they feel that usually uh, trees and nature will have a negative impact on their building. Uh, usually they fear about the roots uh, for the structures of the building. But if you take the right distance between the buildings and the trees, there is no problem. And they'll see also the problem of maintenance because they feel that, um, for example, uh, you will have to, to, to water your trees, to, to cut them, uh, to, to, uh, to avoid leaves. So the maintenance cost is the challenge for, for them. But uh, usually if you design the, a nice mini forest, it can be autonomous uh, quite quickly and you don't have to spend money to, to sustain it. Yep. Is there any kind of limitation, like minimum space that you need to plant, or what would be like a starter pack that you could say yeah. where you would start with? You, usually, you can start a mini forest from six parking places, so 70 square meter. Uh, but you can have really a, a, a good feeling of mini forest at the sweet spot is 200 uh, square meter because you can enter into the mini forest and be surrounded by trees and biodiversity. And for example, for buildings, when you have workers, you can put a, a table inside the mini forest so they can have their lunch break there. So that's really is a sweet spot, 200 square meter. And um, uh, right now, I mean, um, uh, what are like uh, uh, the, the kind of key partners that you work with? Is it more like businesses or is it municipalities that are now kind of waking up to this whole CSR, you know, let's do something green uh, topic? Um, how is that? What do you see like on, on your market? Yeah, I thought that my customer would be um, cities uh, and municipalities, but uh, uh, being here in, in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands is the number one country in Europe to have planted a mini forest in 2015. 
So they, all the cities have already uh, a lot of mini forests. And right now, uh, the customers are more private uh, companies or private owners companies, because as you say, for the Sierra CSR policy, they want to involve uh, their employees about it. And also private uh, owners. Uh, I have a lot of uh, grandparents who want to, to plant some mini forests in the backyard of their house with their grandchildren, for example. So with like four minutes left, would there be any other question in the round or any other comment uh, I would like to utilize? Thank you so much, JB, for, uh, you know, sharing the insights on, on Miyawaki method. Yeah, I, I, I very much like to uh, say uh, how, how much I, I enjoy uh, your presentation. And uh, I wonder if you've uh, known about uh, an organization called Green Water Cools. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. It? Well, yes, it's it's um, it's founded by Marcel de Berg, uh, who is uh, in Holland, in, in the Netherlands. Yes, he's uh, so, um, and it's um, really concerned about how uh, transpiration is is the cooling mechanism of the planet, right? And and so you know it it brings us to a view of the forest as not only as a carbon sink, but as an active uh, cooling planetary cooling agent um, and and so while the carbon may change slowly because it will you know it's so much to be absorbed the um, the actual uh, cooling impact can go faster and and of course very low cost that's the beauty of sometimes you know really the low tech uh, solutions that have a high impact uh, and we love that we definitely love that we're a big supporter of this and so uh with like two minutes uh, left i would definitely like to thank um netu giant for uh, joining us uh today and uh telling us more about you know all the different types of coatings uh, sharing the statistics we're going to share a little like uh, update uh, on this on social media so you get some insights over there as well thank you as well uh mr jb chavron hopefully i pronounce it correctly and jb please correct me always <laughs> uh, on this i'm not a you know native french whatever uh speaker native speaker so uh, thanks a lot for sharing insights on miyawaki forests how trees help you know wh why are they needed and they are an essential part uh for planning properties planning uh, landscapes uh and uh, kind of Re, re uh reimagining the way we plan cities and live in cities and spaces so i i love this i definitely love the idea